Uh, well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's uh, Gary Mortimer from the, the QUT Business School, and, and I do hope that everyone can hear me. Um, welcome along. It's great to be back for, for 2020 um, for, I guess, our next series of, of webinars on behalf of the National Retail Association. Um, just before we get going, you may see on your screen, just at the bottom there, there's a little chat box. So um, with, with a number of people online currently, we generally sort of, uh, I guess, mute um, uh, your mics so that there's not too much noise in the background for, for everyone else. And, and hopefully you hear me reasonably clearly. Uh, so with the chat box, listen, if you have some questions as we go through this, um, type in a couple of uh, lines, type in a couple of questions. Um, I, I'll, I'll get to them as we go through the presentation or alternatively what I might do is just leave it to the end and then uh, address questions uh, as a whole. So we're going to talk today about promotions and promotions management particularly. Uh, and we're going to talk about different types of promotional tactics that you may want to implement into your business, into your retail business. And, and importantly, towards the back end of the presentation, I'm going to spend some time looking at metrics and how to how to measure some of these uh, these promotions. Um, I always like to to start with, um, I guess, a little bit of context. Uh, you know, where where retail has gone and where retail is going to. And I often think about my own career, so starting in retail well over 30 years ago, and and how retail is fundamentally changed. Now I started. Uh, my retail career straight out of high school uh, you know, and pushing shopping trolleys for a, for a supermarket. Um, and, and we can see today how retail has evolved, even, you know, essentially a case where we now no longer physically push shopping trolleys as Coles rolls out sort of automatic trolley pushes to enable and assist people. But I think about scanner technology that we have today, it was never the case 30 years ago. Everything was, was price mark, which put a, a challenge into actually doing you know, promotional pricing. Uh, of course, we've got sort of the, the growth of online and, and internet, which has now enabled us to target consumers more effectively and therefore you know, get better value for money out of our promotional budgets. We've seen the growth of social media. Uh, and I often talk about social media uh, when I'm dealing with my students and I explain that you know, brands are now connecting with us uh, just in the same way we connect and engage with our friends and family uh, online. So these sort of changes have, I guess, in many ways created um, both challenges but opportunities for retail managers when they go about planning their promotions, whether it's a monthly promotional plan or a weekly plan or an annual plan. You know, and we ask our question, you know, when we're sitting with our team, we're often finding ourselves asking those questions around, you know, should we do a, a, a percentage of category sale next month? Uh, should we only look at maybe children's wear or toys? Um, should we maybe look at a bundle sale? Um, you know, do, should we limit inventory or the promotional time or period? Uh, you know, should we link up promotions with a social good, which seems to be a, another emerging social trend? Um, so I want to address some of those, those questions, uh, gi give you some, I guess, food for thought on the types of promotions that you may want to consider um, as you move forward in the year ahead, the year ahead uh, 2020 into 2021. Um, so let, let's begin with the different types of promotions that I guess retailers can use and, and are using um, today. I want to address, you know, full disclosure here about my criticisms around um, straight discounting or direct discounting. Uh, and you may or may not agree here, but what, what I've found and what you've probably found as you've walked through shopping centres or high streets is this over-dependence on simply percentage off sales, whether it's 30 or 40% off or 50% or off. And I'm critical of this type of promotion for a number of reasons. Number one, we know that consumers become very skeptical if you're constantly at 20 or 30 or 40% off. And there's a running joke around my household currently about Nick Scarly Furniture uh, that is always on sale. And they're currently doing their January sale. They've just done their December Christmas sale. And in November, they did a, a Black November sale. So they took the Black Friday sales event and stretched it over an entire month. And there's also a kitchenware retailer near where I live uh, who has, for the last seven months now, done a, a $10 million warehouse clearance sale 
with prices slashed by up to 70%. So that signage and message hasn't changed in nearly seven months. So when shoppers are walking past stores that are constantly at 30, 40 or 50% off, they become sceptical. Um, they, they question margins and go, well, listen, if you can afford to discount at 50% off uh, or 60% off, then what on earth could your margins be? And discounting also, particularly over a long period of time, limits that sense of urgency. So I know that particular kitchen goods retailer, I'm not going to rush in and buy anything because I know it's always going to be 70% off. It'll be 70% off next week and the week after. So we create less urgency in the market to come and visit us if we're always discounting. The other challenge it creates is, is that it costs us more money to actually deliver the same sales revenue. So if you're discounting at 25% off, in order to actually grow your sales line by better than last year, you need to sell 25% more inventory if you're discounting at 25%, which means you're buying more inventory or handling more inventory. Uh, your, your, your logistics and distribution costs go up and generally your staffing costs go up as well. And the other challenge with simply discounting sales is easily copied. So if you're going to do 30% off next week, guarantee the guy across the road will do 35% off and it becomes a race to the bottom. Percentage off sales work occasionally if it's a short-term uh, venture to clear inventory, but stretching it out over a long period of time, there really is some challenges with this. And I think we're now seeing that in the market when we see you know, retailers collapsing because of sustained discounting over a long period of time. So I guess what I'd like to do in this conversation is maybe look at other options other than simply a direct percentage off promotion. And I want to look at the objectives. And I think sometimes we tend to run promotions or plan promotions without really thinking about what is the objective that we want to achieve because every promotion will have a specific objective. And I'm going to give you three or four examples of these types of objectives. So maybe one is about moving more inventory or maybe your objective is to create a positive experience and surprise for customers. Um, and also, most importantly, at the end of this is, is how do I measure the impact of that promotion? Was it a successful as I think it was. So let's look at the first one. The first one is um, you know, often referred to as a bundle or a twofer or a threefer deal. Now, while I say that there's no direct discounting, you'll see in the advertising messages and in the treatments, there is no discussion of a percentage off. So there's no 40% off or 33% off or 25% off. The offers are two for, so you you know get two for the price of one, or buy three and you get one free, or get three for the price of two. Those types of messages actually communicate value rather than a price off. Now, smart consumers will work out pretty quickly that you know if I'm going to buy two T-shirts and get one free, that's effectively a 33% discount. And you can qualify that by saying, listen, buy two T-shirts and get one for equal or lesser value. So the maximum is going to be a 33% discount, but it might be a 27% discount if someone buys two $20 T-shirts and they get a $15 T-shirt that they choose for free. What this does, not only does it communicate a value proposition to a consumer, hey, I'm not thinking about the discount I'm getting, I'm actually getting something for free. It also moves inventory. So the objective with this style of promotion is to move inventory without any direct discounting. Now, if we think about an end of season run, a seasonal sale where you want to get rid of obsolete product, maybe you're a consumer electronics company or a fashion retailer or a footwear retailer, and that the season's changing, if you do a 30% off discount sale, there is an element of consumers that will walk in and buy one item probably the most popular item, and they'll save 30% and they'll walk out. If you do buy two, get one free, it's still a 30% discount, but they're walking out with three items. So you're actually moving a lot more of that inventory in one single sale. And the customer's seeing a value proposition. A similar way is the bundle sales. And, and, and you know, fast food retailers like KFC and McDonald's do this exceptionally well. So yes, you can buy a burger and a hash brown or a can of Coke or whatever individually, but we're going to bundle this together for you under one low price. 
Uh, and again, it becomes a, 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 a value proposition. The customer perceives they're getting an entire package. And you can do that across the board. I mean, the example there is, you know, I, I can discount my nail polish, uh, but not my clear coat and my file, but I can do the whole lot together. And we can call this uh, you know, manicure week where you get the entire package for one low price. So I'm generating more sales and I'm moving more inventory out than simply only selling the discounted item. Coffee and a muffin is another great example, but you know, a quick look at what KFC and McDonald's do with their, with their packages, you can see that the benefit of actually you know, turning over more inventory than simply selling just one item here and one item there at a discounted price. The other one is um, getting something for free. Again, no discounting and, and across the advertising treatments, you're not seeing that percentage off sale. It's a very different offer than what we see normally in the marketplace. And I've given a couple of examples here and, and um, I'll step through each of them because I think it's quite an interesting way to promote your business or promote your brand, create some sales um, and, and create interest around your brand. So the first one up there is East Massage. And um, this is clearly a voucher that's probably been bought for, for someone, but there's a promotional offer and it's a, a free car diffuser valued at $10. So straight away, we're going to put some value on that offer. Uh, so the perception is, well, we can get a diffuser. It's, the value is $10. Um, so, so I can see that I'm getting something for free. And you might think, well, what does a diffuser have anything to do with, with a massage? Most car diffusers will sit in your car, generally on your air conditioning vent, which means every time you're in your car, you're seeing that brand, you're seeing East Massage. So when you feel like, gee, I feel like a massage, that brand has been top of mind in your car for the last three weeks or three months or, or six months, however long, however long that diffuser lasts. Yeah, other examples might be a reusable shopping bag. Uh, you know, buy the shoes today, comes with this amazing uh, canvas bag, which is a bit of artwork on it and it's clearly branded. So every time you, carry that around and do your grocery shopping with it, your brand is top of mind to that consumer. We also see businesses tending to use terms like complementary rather than free. And free tends to suggest from a consumer's perspective, it, it has no value. So it's a free diffuser or it's a free beer or it's a free something. But a complementary product tends to suggest an element of gratitude. So we're grateful for your business. We're grateful that you came in today and bought, you know, a $300 pair of, you know, new spectacles. So we'd like to offer you a complimentary lens cleaner uh, case and, and, uh, and cleaning cloth. So the term complimentary actually creates this sense of gratitude that we're showing you some gratitude for your custom today. Uh, another great example is, is uh, particularly if you're in food retailing, is complimentary samplers. And I was in um, Tasmania last week uh, at the university and every afternoon I, I walked off of campus and through Salamanca and uh, the boards were coming out in Salamanca across the bars and they're all doing happy hour and they were all discounting their beer and their wine and it was $7 for a schooner, it was $10 for a wine. But no one was offering a sampler menu. And, and so instead of discounting your beer and your wine, it offered them a complimentary um, sampler menu. And this is quite clever because I think you, you go in uh, for happy hour, you're getting people, you're getting bums on seats, and they get a bit of a sample. They get a little bit of calamari, uh, you know, they get a little meatball, they get a little bit of uh, cinnamon toast there or, or sesame seeds toast, and that creates an appetite. And you generally find people go, that was really nice, I might stay for a meal. Um, so you're not really discounting your beer or your wine, you're actually giving them a sample of what they could get if they remained. And you could probably do the same thing in a cafe. So, you know, happy hour only, not all the time. Uh, in the afternoon, every cappuccino comes with a little mini muffin. Uh, you know, being able to sample and try uh, your food may get people to go, oh, I might buy a pack of four before I leave or I'll come back and, and, uh, and, and have morning tea here tomorrow. So think about something for free and think about the term a complimentary gift, a complimentary uh, satchel, bag, uh, or, or meal. The other one I like is um, email marketing. And email marketing um, has certainly provided retailers 
with greater opportunity to segment and target their key markets. Interestingly enough, um, I was talking to one of the major retailers recently about um, their digital marketing plans, and uh, they said we don't we don't SMS our customers because SMS tends to be quite a personal issue. When your mobile phone goes off, you expect it to be a child or a family member or a friend. You don't expect it to be a retail brand or a supermarket. So they steer away from SS, SMS marketing and move more towards um, email marketing. And email tends to be more personal. You can address it to the person using your database. Uh, and I remember working for a number of large um, retailers, Meyer and Grace Brothers, for a number of years. And we would send um, physical uh, invitations, so paper-based letters, to our most valuable customers. And we'd invite them in. Uh, to a seasonal launch or to a launch of a new product, or we'd run a VIP night. And they're quite interesting in the way that people love to come out and, and visit a store after hours. Uh, and, and we would, you know, we'd put on, you know, some champagne. Everybody would get a glass of champagne and they'd come through the store whilst the store was closed to everybody else. But being invite, being personally invited in via an email or by mail actually create a very special experience for customers and they can make some purchases. Now, you don't have to be a David Jones or a Meyer to do this type of thing. I was in a, in a centre recently. It was six o'clock and I was walking through the centre. Uh, the majority of stores were closed. And there was an unbranded, sort of private um, brand uh, ladies apparel store. Their target market was larger sizes, so larger size ladies. And it was ladies apparel. And, and their store was open, but they, they'd done the little red carpet out the front. They had little bollards. Uh, and I could see there was probably 40 people inside. Uh, and they were there with the manager, and the manager was bringing out and showing them the new ranges for the new season ahead. And that type of event can be really cheaply managed. So a couple of bottles of champagne, a couple of cheese plates, you, you send an, an email invitation to your very best clients, your very best customers. You, you state that it's a, a one, one-off event, limited numbers. Um, you, know, you create that, I guess, sense of scarcity and fear of missing out in many ways. And then you send a reminder email later in the week and then a final reminder on the, on the morning of, to say, you know, tonight is, you know, the, the event, it's six o'clock, glass of champagne, you'll see the new season's range. And ultimately, you could do that for a number of categories. You know, I think about um, sporting goods. Uh, you know, you could have, um, you know, one of the representatives from uh, possibly Grey Nicholas Cricket Bats, or you could be a consumer electronics company and you could bring in, say, a representative from Motorola uh, and you would invite your key customers to come in to look at the new Motorola Razor that they're about to relaunch. And this is before sale, uh, so VIP event. And it's those types of VIP events um, coming into the store, having a glass of champagne or a beer, looking at a product or a range of products before it goes to market, before the season launches, really creates a lot of interest and excitement. And generally, it brings people back the next month. I talked a little bit about um, simulated um, scarcity. And again, before we do this, we always need to look at that objective. So the objective here is to increase that perception of value and create urgency. Um, again, an example, when I worked for, um, for, for Maya many years ago and also Grace Brothers in Sydney, I, I'd come from a discount department store sector uh, and I had the mindset of stack it high, watch it fly. And I remember working in the menswear department, it was coming into Father's Day, and I'd stacked a whole pile of men's box polo shirts on this display. And the, the general manager at the time said, you know, get rid of that inventory and put maybe only 10 or 12 boxes out there. And I never really understood what he meant by that until we've actually tested this through research. And this is simply supply and demand, basic economics. If you perceive that there's less inventory, there is an urgency to buy because there is a fear of missing out. If you perceive that there is lots of available inventory, you don't need to rush in and buy anything because it'll be there next week and it'll be there next month. And you also expect it to be cheap because if it's stacked to the roof, it's got to be cheap. So interestingly enough, uh, at this particular store, I did. I removed nearly all of the inventory off the display. I had 12 boxes of box polo shirts out there and immediately it started to sell because the perception was, gee, if I, if I don't get one now, I'm going to sell out. Dad's going to miss out. 
Uh, so I replenished the stock about lunchtime. I only put about 12 on the table and I replenished the stock that evening, only about 12 on the table. And over the week, sold all of my inventory by simply replenishing it slowly. So that's simply by giving that perception of limited inventory. And we often see sales pop up saying limited time only. Um, so while, we, while I was very critical, I guess, of discounting, discounting for a limited time, a flash sale, uh, works quite well to create some excitement and urgency to bring people in. But a discount sale that goes for an entire week or month tends to not create the same level of urgency. So at limited time, uh, you know, I worked for, for retailers where we would do um, one hour spot sales uh, in the afternoon. We would announce it. Uh, and of course, with the, the growth of social media, if you have a social media platform and you've got you know, three or four or 500 people or even a 1,000 people following your brand, uh, being able to push that message out today and saying, listen, this afternoon at five o'clock, we're going to do a one-hour spot, spot sale, you know, come and visit us. So digital and social media uh, has worked really well for these types of um, short sales events. Um, leveraging luck. Uh, Again, the objective here um, is we want to drive fun and excitement through charts, but also possibly closing the sale. So when we think about running a promotion, what's the objective? What do we want to get out of this particular promotional tactic? And on this one, it's about closing the sale, about creating fun and excitement. So this is about um, the blind bag philosophy. Um, so, the reason why Woolworths's uh, Lion King Bushies worked so well and, and Coles's uh, Little Shop worked so well was because of the blind bag um, strategy. Customers never knew what was inside the pack they got, which created suspense, it created surprise, and it brought people back the next week or the next day in some cases wanting to get the next one. And every time you open up that bag, think about the old Kinder Surprise egg, you don't know what's inside. Sometimes you get a great surprise and you get that one collectible that you're looking for. Sometimes you open it up and you go, well, oh, I've already got a duplicate. I'm not, it's not, not particularly a great surprise. But what do you do? You go back again to try and get the full set. The psychology behind it is the same psychology we use to understand why people problem gamble. So we're thinking about Keno and playing the pokies. It's called intermittent reward. So occasionally we give people a nice little surprise they didn't anticipate. Think about watching someone on the pokey machine. They put in $10, they press the button and they don't win. They press the button and they don't win. So before they cash out, on the third push, they always get a prize. And then they lose two and they win one, and they lose two and they win one. So intermittently they'll keep gambling in order to try and get that money back. And the blind bag philosophy works exactly the same way. We're going to keep coming back. We're going to keep shopping because we want to see if we can collect the full set. How might you apply that in your store? Think about scratchies. Think about um, a lucky envelope or a lucky dip. And I think about like a, a, a footwear store where you've got a customer in the store. They've tried a couple of pairs of shoes on. They're undecided. They may go to a competitor down the road. So rather than trying to push a price message, give them the option to say, listen, today we're doing a special promotion. It's a, it's a lucky envelope special promotion, uh, and you can win a variety of different prices and gifts and discounts. Here's the envelope. Customer doesn't know what's in it. You open it up, the customer opens it up, and it could be, listen, you get a, a free leather care kit on your next purchase. Uh, maybe you're an electronic goods retailer and you sell television sets. Customers been in the store for a little while. They're looking at different television sets. Before they walk away, we're doing a promotion this week. It's a, a, a lucky envelope promotion or it's a lucky scratchy promotion. You might win a prize. You might not win a prize. That's a part of the, the game. That's a part of the chance that you play. Uh, and they scratch the, the, the scratch here. And what they find is they get an extended 12-month warranty on their next purchase. So that on the next purchase tends to be the trigger to say, well, hey, if I buy my shoes today or I buy the television set today, I've got a bit of a bonus and I didn't expect to get that bonus when I walked through the door today. So unexpected surprise, leveraging luck. Maybe you get you know, a cleaning kit, maybe you save 10%, maybe you get two for one. 
So great way to run a blind bag promotion in your store. And again, it doesn't necessarily talk about 30, 40, 50% off. Um, and the last tactic, uh, and I think this is now emerging, and it's emerging probably as a direct result of what we've seen happen in Australia over the last uh, over the last couple of years, and more recently uh, through December and, and January, and that's um, the impact of the drought, and more recently the the impact of bushfires. So you may want to consider linking your promotions to an important cause. Now that might be a national cause or a cause that's very important within your community or within your region. Again, the objective, what's the objective here? The objective is to make customers feel good about their purchases. Now, there is some research around that shows that during times of uh, economic distress or natural disaster, um, consumers feel less willing to splurge on themselves if they know their counterparts in other towns and cities are doing it tough. Ultimately, as a part of the Aussie, Aussie psyche that, you know, when, when towns are running out of water, when we've got bushfires, when we've got regional and rural towns struggling, do we really want to go and treat ourselves to a new handbag or a pair of shoes? So being able to offer some form of, I guess, incentive to shoppers to say, listen, for every dollar you spend here, we're going to donate X amount to a particular important cause is a great way not only to support causes, but also help customers feel good about their purchases. And of course, there's a number of ways that you can do it. I mean, you can do a purchase-based donation. So for every cup of coffee we sell next week, we're going to donate one dollar to the, the, the women's legal service, if that's an important cause uh, for your target market. Or you can actually give some of the power back to the consumer. So a customer-directed donation. So we often see this with, with primary schools and um, the Sports for Schools program. So in a supermarket, they may have three or four local primary schools lined up and you put a token in whichever school you want to support. So in this way, we, we're still supporting schools, but we're going to allow the customer to make that choice of where they want to support the school. Uh, and, and of course, from that comes great promotional partnerships where if you're supporting a particular charity, that charity might put you onto their website to say you're a trusted partner and you're actually providing some form of revenue and support for us. And equally, you're able to use their uh, branding in your store when they walk in. You can see that we're aligned to maybe the Cancer Council of Queensland or, or Blood Service or, or, blind, or, or, or Guide Dogs. So lots of different promotions that you can use other than simply let's do 30% off next week or for off an entire category. Uh, really important before you think about implementing any of those, think about the objective. What do we want to do? Do we Is this about moving more inventory uh, or is it about creating experience and surprise or making people feel great about themselves and great about their purchases? In this last, I guess, probably the last 10 minutes of this presentation, and, and I'm happy to sort of answer any questions that pop up in that little chat box there, um, I, I want to talk about measuring pr promotions. So this is promotions management and looking at the metrics that you need to, to consider. The first one is promotional sales per square metre. I'm not sure how many people are currently doing this. And the big guys do this, the big shopping centres and the big uh, retailers do this, but maybe not so much the smaller retailers. So measuring your promotional sales per square metre is a great indicator of floor space productivity. How well are you using the floor space in your store when you run a promotion? So we're going to use an example. We're going to run through these metrics using one simple example. And we're going to use a hypothetical retailer, simply a giftware store, and they might sell you know, um, candle and incense, they might sell books, cards and wrapping, um, possibly giftware and, and homewares. So on a general base, that, that they sell about $30,000 a week out of their um, 150 square metre store, smallish store. So we simply make that that, that, that calculation. So 30,000 divided by 150 gives me approximately 200 dollars per square meter. Then what we're going to do is we're going to analyze at the end of our promotion. So the following week we ran a promotion, we did something online, we ran uh, some signage out the front, we advertised in local press, we did a TVC, a TV ad or a radio ad, and our sales grew by 10%. So our sales went up to $33,000. 
naturally our floor space doesn't change. So our sales per square meter also went up an equally 10%. But this is where it's important. Not every category went up by 10%. And this is where you need to analyze those category sales. If you're going to do a promotion, which categories actually performed better than 10%? Because there will be some, and there'll be some that didn't perform at 10%. So the average was 10%, which categories perform better? If we can identify those categories that sold higher than 10%, you're able to allocate more space. Now, in a small store, it may be simple as going, I need to buy more inventory of scented candles and incense, and maybe put in a trestle table to put more of that inventory in the front of customers' faces. Because clearly, when I do a promotion, that category outsells all my other categories. And by doing that, you never miss out on um, sales. You, you never run out of stock because you're changing slightly your layout and floor per square meter depending on your promotion and, and analyzing that promotional sales per square meter. So think about that next time you run a promotion or maybe write that down for your next promotion you're about to do, but measure your square meters, look at your categories and work out which one generated a better sales rate than my overall store sales. The next one is to look at uh, our team members themselves. So um, sales per employee. And in this way, it's enabling us to make probably smarter employment decisions, but also rostering decisions and potentially incentivizing and compensation decisions. So, um, I'll give you an example. If, if we've got our normal store that, you know, it's a giftware store and it generally sells $30,000 per week and we have five employees in that store, um, we'd simply divide, um, and there's the calculation there, promotional sales divided by the number of employees rostered. We'll divide it by five employees and we can see that every employee sells around about $6,000. Now, that might change. You might have someone that works full-time. You might have two part-timers and three casuals. So you work out your rostered team member divided by your promotional sales, and you work out roughly how many sales per team member they're bringing in. Now, generally in promotional periods, and I know, you know after running many businesses for 20-odd years, we generally bring in more staff. We expect there's going to be a sales lift, and in fact, in this hypothetical situation we're using, there's a 10% sales lift. So naturally, we're going to bring in extra people. Let's just say we've, we've brought an extra person. We've actually rostered six people, uh, $33,000 worth of sales, which is a great result, 10% increase in sales. Divided by six employees gives me about $5,500. So what we find is that we've increased our sales by 10%, but by bringing in people, we probably didn't need to bring people in because, in fact, every team member has now generated less sales each. So we may have overstaffed. Um, also, importantly, look at individual differences. Um, you know, while, um, you know, we might have eight staff or, or five staff or three staff in a store, not every team member is going to sell the same volume of staff. And by looking at which team members close the most sales, you can actually roster them into the busiest periods and, and therefore to reduce those costs. So the questions you're asking when you, you, you look at the metrics and the measures of your promotion from last week is while I made 10% sales increase, who were the team members that really did that for me? And did I really need to bring an extra team member in on Saturday if the growth really wasn't there? Great way to, to save costs. Um, the, the, the second last is the average promotional transaction value. So this metric um, tells you how much shoppers um, have spent in your store on average. So here's the calculation, simply total sales divided by um, the transactions, so the actual physical sales that, that took place. So again, here's the example, giftware store, on average, $30,000 per week. Uh, 275 transactions. So the average sale per customer is 109. So this is an average. Some customers will spend more, some customers will sell less. At the end of the week, we can see that we made 275 transactions. Now, uh, we ran a promotion and this promotion delivered a 10% increase in revenue, 10% increase in sales. Our sales grew to $33,000. And we actually tr transacted more sales. We sold uh, to 310 customers. When you divide it, what you realize is that the average sale was less. 
So why was it less? Was it that we discounted? And this is, again, that criticism around if we're discounting at 20 and 30% off, we might get some more sales, but the average sale per customer actually declines. So you should often be aware that promotional periods may not actually increase the average transaction per customer. And the aim of the, and the, aim of the day is to try and get people to spend more rather than serve a lot more people, put a lot more, customer, uh, put a lot more staff on, only to have them spend less. And the last one is a conversion rate. And I think this is probably a really important one to, to do. If you're going to measure anything, um, the conversion rate, I think, is probably one of the most important metrics that, that you should be looking at after you've run a week or a month's promotion. So here's the, um, here's the calculation. It's customer transactions, actual purchases, divided by customers who visited and walked into your store times 100 to get your percentage. Now, I don't know if you, you use people meters. They're the little people meters that usually sit on the uh, entrance points of the fronts of stores. If you don't, um, buy yourself one. They're, they're pretty cheap and you can buy them on um, uh, Amazon and eBay and Alibaba as well. They're like a little digital uh, infrared light and it just clicks every time somebody walks into your store. So you can work out pretty quickly uh, how many people visit you each day um, and some actually work quite well and give you sort of an hourly breakdown. So you, you want to be able to work out how many customers come in each week to visit you. So back to our normal case, our giftware store that sells $30,000 every week, we know that we, we sell on average 275 transactions. So we actually process 275 customers. But to do that, on average, 510 customers come in and visit us times by 100 gives me 54%. What that tells me is that around about 54% of people that walk in the store buy an item. So that's one in two. That's, that's pretty good because a lot of people do walk in to browse. In a promotional week, remember, we're now served 310 people. We've actually served more people this time. And that seems reasonable because we've actually promoted really heavily. We've advertised and people have come in. In fact, a lot more people have come in. 625 people have clicked through that people reader at the front of the door. What we notice though, is that our actual conversion rate fell. While we attracted more people to our store, fewer people actually bought. And that signals some really interesting sort of, uh, I guess, questions as you move forward with your management team or with your team in the store. Clearly we've, in, we've invited more people in, more people have visited, but fewer people have bought. So what didn't we do right in this promotion? Because ultimately, when you want to run a promotion, you should be at least converting more people to real sales. So simply, you ran a promotion, more people came through the front door, but fewer actually bought anything. So I guess ultimately, we've looked at the beginning of this presentation about different types of promotional tactics that you can implement which is outside the norm of simply doing straight discounting. But it's really, really important to, to measure the metrics associated with those promotions. Um, not just revenue. Revenue is simply overly simplistic. If I look at a store that says we did a 10% increase on last year and our sales last week grew to 33%, at, at face value, that, that seems a great result. You know, we grew our sales by 10%, but the average sale per team member actually fell the average spend per customer fell. So people walked in and because of the discounting, they walked out and spent less money in our store. And the conversion rate, uh, conversion rate also fell. So more people came to visit us, but less people actually bought anything. So I like looking at metrics and, and generally we tend to find that um, you know, we run great promotions, but we tend to not measure the outcome of those promotions critically um, or we simply look at that very top line and go, gee, it was a successful promotion because we did a 10%, uh, I guess, increase in sales. So, so as we wrap up, and, and again, I invite you to, to write a couple of questions if you like. Um, really, you should be able to now start to determine some strategic promotional aims and objectives. And those objectives may change. So at the end of a season, your objective might be to clear out inventory and you'll choose promotional tactics that will help you do that. Or your aim or your objective might be to create a, 
fabulous positive experience for customers and generate repeat business. So maybe VIP nights and launches. Uh, or maybe your um, objective is to, 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 to close sales and to create a, a sense of, of chance and excitement and surprise. You should also be able to critique promotional strategies now. You should be able to, to step back and go, let's have a look at, you know, the, the categories that sold better than other categories last week or last month. Um, or, or let's have a look at uh, our conversion rate. I mean, of the people that walked in, I mean, how many did we actually convert to real sales? And then when critiquing those strategies, work out pretty quickly, listen, that promotion didn't really deliver on the objectives that we were hoping for, and then simply don't repeat it. Um, but certainly look to, to track that performance. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, sometimes you think those promotions are really working because you're measuring that top line all the time, but you, you may be missing some other really important metrics along the way as well. So guys, listen, thanks for, um, for, for taking sort of 40 minutes out of your day to, to listen to me bang on about um, promotions management and metrics. Hopefully you've got a couple of ideas that you've, uh, you've written down there that you might be able to, to walk away with. Um, and, and of course, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. You'll have to type them into that little box there at the bottom um, and, and I'll address them. Um, or alternatively, you'll see there at the bottom, um, there's the, uh, the email address for um, the National Retailers Association. So certainly contact them. They can get you in contact with me um, and we'll go from there. Um, I'll be back uh, later this year. There's another four of these webinars that we'll be discussing uh, uh, over 2020 and hopefully more in 2021 as well. So um, hopefully you've got a little something out of this uh, today. Uh, thanks, guys.